Every time the sun rises, you must start making decisions. It starts with fairly simple decisions. What should I wear to work? What do I want for breakfast? To extremely stressful decisions. How should I respond to my rebellious daughter? Or how can my business succeed when my supply chain is broken? According to Inc. Magazine, adults make more than 35,000 decisions per day. The number of decisions we have to make in a day can become so overwhelming that by the end of the day, it's a wonder we are able to decide what to eat for dinner. That is what's known as decision fatigue. If you have ever wondered how to make consistently wise decisions throughout your day, you will want to listen in as Nathan Norman, Kent Edwards, and Vicki Hitzkiss look at David's good and bad decision making in 1 Samuel chapters 21 through 23. Welcome to Crosstalk, a Christian podcast whose goal is for us to encourage each other to not only increase our knowledge of the Bible, but to take the next step beyond information into transformation. Our goal is to bring the Bible to life into all our lives. I'm Brian French. Today, Dr. Kent Edwards, Vicki Hitzkiss, and Nathan Norman continue their discussion through 1 Samuel. And if you have a Bible handy, turn to 1 Samuel chapters 21 through 23 as we join their discussion. Everyone makes decisions, but some are easier than others. Nathan, Vicki, what are some difficult decisions you've seen other people had to make? Oh, this seemed to have happened more when I was growing up, but I remember some girls in high school get pregnant and they'd want the baby and the mother would want to put it up for adoption or have it mm. aborted. And it was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. You have decisions of when you lose your job, whether to stay in an area, uh, to mm -hmm. be with your church family so your kids can continue to have their friends or to move. Uh, those are really hard decisions that a lot of us have had to make. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that there are decisions that people have to make end of life, mm -hmm. right? Do we, do we continue to allow our loved one to be on life support, even though there really doesn't look like there's hope, but maybe there is, but, but it doesn't look like that. But my family members are saying there could be, but the doctor's saying there isn't. Uh, so when to stop and when to continue to give that end of life care is excruciatingly hard. And it even is. before that, can we take care of our parent or should we... Um, put them in care. Um, that's right. that's a big decision. It when is. do we take away the keys? Big mm. deal. This, there's a lot of end of life decisions that are tough. Yeah, it's very hard for children to become the authority, the the, the parent, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very hard. It's easy to look at others making hard decisions like that and think that it's easy. It's hard when you're in the midst of it, isn't it? When the pressure is on, when the consequences are great. It's much harder to make good decisions. Certainly, I think we see that with David. If uh, people have been listening the past few weeks, we've been following David's life and see his rise from obscurity as he begins to uh, uh, become his own person on his way to become the leader of Israel. When we come to chapter 21 to 23, well, David's facing a difficult time, isn't he? Nathan, would you help us set the context of what we're looking at here in these chapters? Okay, so David was anointed by God through Samuel to be the king of Israel, but not mm -hmm. everyone recognizes that anointing. <laughs> uh, he has not been uh, coronated by the rest of the nation. And so he has people who are allied to him. He has mm -hmm. trusted advisors and allies, uh, but he doesn't have anything. He is married to one of Saul's daughters, but he, Saul has continually tried to turn his daughter against him and use his daughter as a way to murder David. Mm -hmm. And so David has virtually nothing and he has to run for his life. Uh, yes, he acknowledges that God has called him to be king, but, uh, but he has to live to see the next day uh, in order for that to happen. Yeah, so the most powerful man in all of Israel, who is King Saul, wants him dead. Right? Right. So when we turn to chapter 21, David is on the run. No resources. He's all on his own. And uh, we see how desperate he is in chapter 21, verse 10, when the best solution to come up with is what? That day, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. 
But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Isn't he the one they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. David was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while it was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so does this strike you as uh, being a comfortable situation for David? No, but I'm surprised that he was afraid. I mean, he just... I don't mean to be crass, but he'd just taken 200 foreskins from the Philistines and he wasn't afraid. Why is he afraid of this one king? Well, uh, certainly he was afraid of Saul, right? Yeah. Saul wanted to kill him, and he felt that he had no friends in Israel. So the safest place, just think about this, the safest place he could find was in with the Philistines, the ones that he was there who was his enemy enemy territory the the land of giants really in gath <laughs> oh yeah this, oh 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 that's right these were the philistines right and this is where goliath came from yes right oh oh okay this makes more sense Thanks. he killed their champion and it's crazy too because the king of a pagan enemy of israel acknowledges david's kingship when even israel doesn't right <laughs> <laughs> true so I think we would agree. David's under enormous stress here, right? Oh, right. Incre yeah. <laughs> well, to, 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 to debase yourself, to act like a crazy person and, and work up the saliva so that your big, bushy Jewish beard is covered in saliva and it's running down your face. I mean, I, I don't have a big beard if you're listening at home, viewers <laughs> or listeners, right? But, but it would take a lot of saliva for me to have that start going off my face. Now, if I had a full beard, like most men of Israel did at this time. Ah, it's just disgusting. And he did this to himself because that's how <laughs> afraid he was of being destroyed by, by these people. Yeah. And uh, please don't, uh, don't imitate him. We don't, we don't want to see that. That's not a visual we would appreciate. This so, is descriptive, not prescriptive. Oh, good, good, good. So in the midst of this, what does he need? David needs to have provisions. How is he going to survive? Uh, he needs, he just ran for his life away from Saul. He doesn't have any food. He doesn't have any weapons. Um, he's got nothing going for him. But also, he needs a strategy. I mean, it's clear that hiding out in with the Philistines is not going to last long term. So he needs some resources, and he needs a strategy to uh, to do what he can uh, in order to survive. So look what David does. First, how he manages with provisions in chapter twenty-one. How does he try to solve that problem? Well, so David went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him, and he asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? And David answered Ahimelech, the priest, The king sent me on a mission, and he said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. <laughs> well, that wasn't why, true. Yeah, it's not true, right? Uh, why did the priest tremble? Because he's not dumb. He knows that Saul wants to kill David. And he doesn't want to be in the middle of it, right? No. How would he know? How would he know that? Well, I mean, Saul's tried to skewer him at least twice, right? And then he's tried <laughs> to skewer his son. That that kind of information kind of leaks out, right? It's around. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, the Academy Awards tried to censor the slap Will Smith gave over the weekend, and uh, and it still got out. It was the first thing I saw on my Twitter feed the next morning. Right? Yeah, but so, we were all watching that. Right, but, I mean, but it didn't air on American channels. It it, it oh, aired over Japanese channels, and then everyone... No, but it did. I mean, we saw it. We just couldn't hear it. Oh. <laughs> Gossip spreads. Yeah. No, that's no. true. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And what does so David anyway, say next? Okay, so then he goes, give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. That seems meager. But the priest answered, David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. What does that mean? It means they weren't sexually active. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I mean, what's consecrated bread? It means it was devoted to the Lord. So it was a, a, an offering to the Lord that had been and, given to the Lord. And it could really, truly, according to the law, only be consumed by uh, the Levitical priests. 
David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. So had they been set out on some holy mission? No. Oh, no. Okay. No, he's just running for his life. But I bet they hadn't been with women. They were running. Right. But, but the other thing is, is that there was no other men with him. Right. It's just him. <laughs> the men didn't join oh. him till later. Oh, so he's, oh, 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 and the priest thinks he's just gone ahead. Right. right. Okay, okay. So David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. And the priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine whom you've killed in the valley of Eli is here. It is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one, which, you know, that was a big sword. <laughs> and David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. What is David? <laughs> wow. David's a bad liar. I mean, just to be, <laughs> to be fair, I'm out on a mission for the king. I've got a whole bunch of men hiding somewhere, but I forgot my sword. <laughs> well, I don't have any weapons. It. He fell um, for it. And, pl and plus, wouldn't you, think, wouldn't you think this priest who knew how Goliath went down would go, well, what about your slingshot? Where's that? <laughs> but what's, what's David's strategy? So he knows that he needs food and a weapon, right? No question. Um, no question. He's, he's on his own. He's got to eat and he's got to have a way to defend himself. So what's his strategy? Lie. And it's okay because I need it. <laughs> right? Right. Absolutely. He's living by his wits. Look, I've got to survive. Here's an opportunity. I'm going to take advantage of it. I'll lie, get what I need, and leave. And when he leaves, looks like he's won, right? I mean, he looks like he's met his need for provisions. He, uh, he has trusted God for Goliath. He's trusted God. How come he didn't trust God for this? I think it's because of the stress. I think that he's on his own. He's running for his life. I bet you're right. And when we are under stress... It's difficult to make good decisions. Right. I agree with that. So what happens? So let's look at a different decision he's got to make. He's got to decide on strategy. He hears that there is a town of uh, in Israel that is being attacked, the town of Keilah. So he's got to decide on a strategy. He's got food. He's got a weapon. In fact, interestingly, men began to gather around him. At this point, he's probably got about 400 men who are following him. But he's a strategy. Are, are they Philistines? No. Men of Israel okay. uh, gathered with him. He's back in Israel territory. And uh, he's got to decide what is he going to do. He hears about a town called Keilah that uh, is under attack from the Philistines. And uh, he, needs to know, he needs to make a decision. And he does make a decision. We read in chapter 22 that David and his men went to Keilah, fought the Philistines, and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses on the Philistines and saved the people of Keilah. Whew. Was that a good decision? Absolutely. Sounds like it. Yeah. That bought him a favor with the Israelites. He is their protector. Even though he is at odds with Saul, he is looking out for them. And uh, God uh, gave him great success. So, two different situations making two very different decisions. Let's look at the consequences of that. What was the result of David's reprovisioning from the priest of Nob? He went to the priest, gave those lies in order to get bread and a sword. What happened as a result of the, his decision? Well, we read in chapter 22, Saul found out that the priest had given David food and weapons. And we read in chapter 22, starting in verse 18. It's, it's, no, no, just, just to make sure everybody's with me especially. Was the priest an Israelite or a Philistine? No, the priest was an Israelite. He was a, okay. Saul found out that the priest had given, then how come he had the sword from a Philistine? Well, because was... David had defeated Goliath, and the sword was taken as plunder, essentially. Right. Okay, and that makes sense. It was just a trophy. Okay, so, okay, it says, Saul ordered Doag, the Edomite, 
you turn and strike down the priests. So Doeg turned and struck them down. And that day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests, with its men and children, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. Wow. So because of David's action, Saul found out what had happened, and it led directly to the slaughter of the priests and the town. David lied and people died. Yeah. But in his second decision, should he attack the, the town of Gila, the results were very different. We read in verse 5 that David and his men fought the Philistines and carried off their livestock. He inflicted heavy losses and saved the people of Gila. Not only that, but David left Gila before Saul could find him and escaped into, and into the desert. And a dramatic turn of events, it's almost ludicrous. Uh, in chapter 23, starting in verse 25, read what happens next when Saul is chasing after David. Saul went into the desert of Maon in pursuit of David. Saul was going along one side of the mountain, and David and his men were on the other side, hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his forces were closing in on David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Come quickly, the Philistines are raiding the land. Then Saul broke off his pursuit of David and went to meet the Philistines. <laughs> it's like that scene in Jurassic Park where the kids are in the kitchen and the velociraptors on the one side and they right, keep right. scurrying around the, the kitchen to try and uh, evade, evade sight. Hiding behind the tables. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the last minute, Saul gets called off and uh, runs away. So in that case, in the first decision David made, Things couldn't have been worse. His decision for the bread and the sword led to terrible consequences. In the second decision, should he attack the town, it couldn't have ended better. So what's the difference between these two decisions? Why was one decision so bad and the other one uh, turned out so well? Well, we read uh, starting in chapter 23, what the difference was. In 23, one, what did David do? It said, when David was told, look, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are looting the threshing floors, he inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord answered him, go attack the Philistines and save Keilah. Isn't that interesting? In this case, he went and inquired of the Lord. And again, in verse four, we read what? Once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him, go down to Keilah for I am going to give the Philistines into your hand. Huh. And again, in verse 9, the narrator wants us to notice this. We read that when David learned that Saul was plotting against him. Oh, it says he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod. Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will. Again, David asked, will the citizens of Keilah surrender me and my men to Saul? And the Lord said, they will. Huh. So why was David's decision regarding strategy so effective? What was the difference between this situation and the situation when he needed bread and a sword? Well, one, he was relying on his own instincts and doing what he wanted to do and not doing what God wanted him to do, lie. And on the other one, he was asking God what to do and then doing what God told him. Exactly. In the first situation, he relied on his instincts. He said, I know, I'm smart, I'll figure it out on my own. And he had some short-term success, long-term disaster, but short-term success. In the second one, he did not rely on his own instincts. He said to the Lord, what should I do? Guide me, help me. That's important to note because really it's only when we trust in God's word rather than our own gut instincts that we can succeed in life. We make thousands of decisions in a day, but our, the decisions we make determine our destiny. And making the wrong decision that may seem right at the time will ruin our lives. What David discovered is that when life gets difficult, slow down take time, inquire of the Lord rather than trust our own instincts. To cry out to the Lord and open God's word, 
That's when we can be sure. When our decisions are made in accordance with his word, that is the best path to success, even if it doesn't seem it at the moment. I think that's why Solomon could say, did say in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. What David teaches us here with a bad example and a good example is that when the stresses of life attack us, don't just react. Inquire of the Lord. His guidance is what we need to hear. We often want to solve problems by doing what we want to do. But the best path to success is to rely on God's word rather than our wits to make our ministries flourish. As the song says, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never get discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. I trust that today's discussion of God's word has been helpful and served as an encouragement to not just be hearers of the word, but doers. Together, let's bring God's word to life, to our lives this week. The Crosstalk Podcast is a production of Crosstalk Global, equipping biblical communicators so every culture hears God's voice. To find out more about this educational, nonprofit organization, please visit www.crosstalkglobal.org. You can also support this show by rating it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're enjoying it. Be sure to listen next Friday as we continue our discussion of the book of 1 Samuel. You won't want to miss it. 